Chapter 8, Section 1. What social forces lay behind the rise of capitalism? Capitalist society is a recent, uh, relatively recent development. As Murray Bookchin points out, for, quote, a long era, perhaps spanning more than five centuries, capitalism coexisted with feudal, uh, feudal and simple commodity relationships in Europe. He argues that this period, quote, simply cannot be treated as transitional without reading back in uh, the present into the past, from urbanization to cities, page 179. In other words, capitalism was not an inevitable outcome of history or social evolution. It goes on to note that capitalism existed with growing significance in the mixed economy of the West from the 14th century up to the 17th, but that it literally exploded into being in Europe, particularly England, during the 18th and especially 19th centuries, page 80, 181. Um, the question arises, what lay behind this growing significance? Did capitalism explode due to its inherently more efficient nature, or were there other, non, or were there other non-economic forces at work? As we'll show, it was most definitely the latter. Capitalism was not born from economic forces, but from political actions of social elites, which its usury enriched. Unlike artisan or simple commodity production, wage labor generates inequalities in wealth for the few and will be, so will be selected, protected, and encouraged by those who control the state in their own economic and social interests. The development of capitalism in Europe was favored by two social elites, the rising capitalist class within the degenerating medieval cities and the absolutist statists. The medieval city was, quote, thoroughly changed by the gradual increase in the power of commercial capital due to primarily to foreign trade. By this, the inner unity of the commune was loosened, giving place to a growing caste system and leading necessarily to a progressive inequality of social interests. The privileged minorities pressed ever more uh, def uh, definitely towards a centralization of the political forces of the community. Mercantilism in the per perishing city republics led logically to a demand for a larger economic unit, i.e. to nationalize the market. And by this, the desire for stronger political forms was greatly strengthened. Thus, the city gradually became a small state, paving the way for the coming national state. Rudolf Rocker, Nationalism and Culture, page 194. The rising economic power of the proto-capitalists conflicted with that of the feudal lords, which meant that the former required help to consolidate their position. That aid came in the form of the monarchical state. With the force of absolutism behind it, capital could start the process of increasing its power and influencing by demand the market through state action. As far as the absolute estate was concerned, it was dependent upon the help of those new economic forces and vice versa. The absolute estate, Rocker argues, whose coffers the expansion of commerce filled, at first furthered the plans of commercial capital. Its armies and fleets contributed to the expansion of industrial production because they demanded a number of things for whose large-scale production the shops of small tradesmen were no longer adapted. Thus gradually arose the so-called manufacturers, the forerunners of later large industry. Some of the most important state actions from the standpoint of early industry were the so-called enclosure acts, by which the commons, the free farmland shared communally by the peasants in most rural vi villages, was enclosed or incorporated into the estates of various landlords as private property. We'll talk more about this in section uh, three of this chapter. This ensured a pool of landless workers who had no option but to sell their labor to capitalists. Indeed, the widespread independence caused by the, uh, uh, by the possession of the majority of households of land caused the rising class of merchants to complain that, quote, men who should work as wage laborers cling to the soil and in the naughtiness of their hearts prefer independence as squatters to employment by a master. R.H. Tawney, cited by Alan Elgar in The Apostles of Greed, page 12. In addition, other forms of state aid ensured that capitalist firms got a head start, so ensuring their dominance over other forms of work, such as cooperatives. A major way of creating a pool of resources that could be used for investment was the use of mercantilist policies, which used protectionist measures to enrich capitalists and landlords at the expense of consumers and their workers. For example, one of the most common complaints of early capitalists was that workers could not turn up to work regularly. Once they had worked a few days, they disappeared as they had earned enough money to live on. 
With higher prices for food caused by protectionist measures, workers now had to work longer and harder and so became accustomed to factory labor. In addition, mercantilism allowed native industry to develop by barring foreign competition and so allowed industrials to reap excess profits which they could use to increase their investments. In other words, of Marian socialist eco uh, economic historian Maurice Dobbs, Quote, in short, the mercantile system was a system of state-regulated exploitation through trade, which played a highly important role in the adolescence of capitalist industry. It was essentially the economic policy of an age of primitive accumulation. Studies in Capitalism Development, page 209, if you want the citation. It, as Rocker summarizes, quote, when absolutism had vicariously overcome all opposition to national unification, but its furthering of mercantilism and economic monopoly, it gave the whole social evolution a direction which could only lead to capitalism. This process of state aid in capitalist development was also seen in the United States of America. As Edward Herman pointed out, the level of government involvement in business in the United States from the late 18th century to the present has followed a U-shaped pattern. There was extensive government intervention in the pre-Civil War period, major subsidies, joint ventures with active government participation and direct government production, then a quasi-laissez-faire period between the Civil War and the end of the 19th century, a period marked by the aggressive use of tariff protection, mind you, and state-supported railway construction, key factor in capitalist expansion in the U.S., followed by a gradual upswing of government intervention in the 20th century, which accelerated after 1930. Corporate Control, Corporate Power, page 162. Such intervention ensured that income was transferred from workers to capitalists. Under state protection, America industrialized by forcing the consumer to enrich the capitalists and increase their capital stock. Quote, according to one study, one of, uh, one of, the, uh, of the tariff had been approved in the 1830s, about half the industrial sector of New England would have been bankrupted. The tariff became a near-permanent political institution representing government assistance to manufacturing. It kept, price levels, uh, it kept price levels from being driven down by foreign competition and thereby shifted the distribution of income in favor of owners of industrial property to the disadvantage of workers and customers. Richard B. DeBoeuf, uh, Accumulation and Power, page 56. <clears throat> this protection was essential for, as DeBoeuf notes, the end of the European wars in 1814 reopened the United States to a flood of British imports that drove many American competitors out of business. Large portions of the newly expanded manufacturing base were wiped out, bringing a decade of near stagnation. Unsurprisingly, the era of protectionism began in 1816 with northern agitation for higher, higher tariffs. Um, accumulation in power, page 14 and page 55. Combined with ready repression of the labor movement and government homesteading, see more on that in section five of this chapter, tariffs were the American equivalent of mercantilism, which, after all, w uh, was above all else a policy of protectionism, the use of government to stimulate the growth of native industry. Only once America was at the top of the economic pile did it renounce state intervention, just as Britain did, should note. This is not to suggest that the government aid was limited to tariffs, by the way. The state uh, played a key role in the development of industry and manufacturing. As John Zerzan noted, the role of the state is tellingly reflected by the fact that the armory system now rivals the older American system of manufacturers, term as the more accurate to describe the new system of production methods. Developed in the early 1800s, moreover, the lead in technological innovation during the U.S. Industrial Revolution came in armaments where assured government orders justified fixed, high-cost investments. In special pursue, uh, in, in special pursue mach machinery and managerial personnel. Indeed, some of the pioneering effects occurred, uh, occurred in government-owned armories themselves. The government also actively furthered this process of commercial revolution with public works and transportation and communication. In addition to all this physical aid, state government provided critical help with devices like the Chartered Corporation and other legal changes in the system, which, well, we've covered to some degree or another over the course of this document, which generally favored capitalist interests over the rest of society. Interestingly, interestingly enough, there was increasing inequality between 1840 and 1860 in the U.S. 
This coincided with the victory of wage labor and industrial capitalism. The 1820s constituted a watershed in U.S. life. By the end of that decade, industrialism assured its decisive American victory. By the end of the 1830s, all of its cardinal features were definitively present. This is unsurprising for as We've argued many times the capitalist market tends to increase, not reduce inequalities between individuals and classes. Little wonder that the individualist anarchists at the time denounced the way that property had been transformed into a power with which to accumulate an income, to use the words of J.K. Ingalls. Overall, as Paul, uh, as Paul Omerad puts it, quote, the advice to follow pure free market policy seems to be contrary to the lessons of virtually the whole of economic history since the Industrial Revolution. Every country which has moved into strong, sustained growth has done so in outright violation of pure free market principles. The model of entrepreneurial activity in the product market with judicious state support plus repression in the labor market seems to be the good model of economic development. Death of Economics, page 63. Thus, the social forces at work creating capitalism was a combination of capitalist activity and state action. But without the support of the state, it's doubtful that capitalist activity would have been enough to generate the initial accumulation required to start the economic ball rolling. Hence the necessity of mercantilism in Europe and its modified cousin of state aid, tariffs,